hired at Hasbro, I told my friend Chuck that it's not pronounced Ravage. It's actually Ravage. <laughs> and, and I got, I just told him that in passing. And uh, like five years later, he's like, were you kidding when you said it's Ravage? Because I said that to someone and they're like, no. <laughs> So I've learned to be a little more careful of what I say. So we could talk about Transformers the movie. I, I came on board at Hasbro at the tail end of Revenge of the Fallen as that was uh, wrapping up production. We were to, one of the first things I worked on was, does Jetfire have the ability to space bridge? And what do we call that? So uh, I, I was there uh, right at the uh, start of development for Dark of the Moon and uh, all through uh, um, Age of Extinction. So, Age of Extinction, Michael Bay wasn't sure if he was going to come back. And I think it was at the Dark of the Moon premiere, old man Aaron Archer said, we got another movie we want you to do, it's called Mask. And he's like, no, 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 I can't do a car movie, I'm done doing car movies. Two Transformers movies later. <laughs> so he pitched a mask, he's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I want to do masks, because, you know, it kind of already happened in Dark of the Moon a little bit, with the stealth fighting technology. So we started working on uh, some concept art for what would, what would be the story. Because there was no art team at the studio, we had to start the process of putting some art together and a story and some characters. And one of the things that we wanted to do was bring the Dinobots in to the film. And we created some epic, epic art. I think we used uh, Emiliano, we used Marcello and Ken Christensen, who's in the dealer room over here, to create some, uh, some art. First thing we did was a giant T-Rex with Optimus riding on top of it. And we did, uh, we did all the five Dinobots, and they all had like a special power. Like, uh, it's hard for me to think back that far, but uh, the Stegosaurus would turn into like a wheel. And we created this art of him like coming down the city in, in like a wheel and just tearing everything up. His spikes would like come out and they were just like razor sharp. And uh, so what we had originally story-wise, it was a few years after the Battle of Chicago and the Decepticons were disbanded and there was only a few Decepticons left and they were called the Lords of Deception. Mm -hmm. And they lived out in the desert, and they were led by Lockdown, who was very much a Mad Max-type car. That's always how we had created him in our internal art. And uh, they lived in the cavern with, like, oil drums, and they had the heads of the twins on chains. And every time they walked out, every time they walked out of the cave, they would just tap the heads and transform and roll out. We had Oil Slick, the, uh, the motorcycle from Animated. We created some sick art that, unfortunately, is, is gone right now. And uh, so the story would start off with, there was this base out, this human base out in the desert, and the Autobots would ferry it, uh, supplies and personnel, and so it started off with Tyrese and Ratchet. And they were on this mission to bring goods to this base, and they get ambushed by the Lords of Deception. And Lockdown takes Ratchet, kills him with his own saw, rips it off, and puts him on his arm. And then he kills Tyrese. But to uh, backtrack a little bit, at uh, Revenge of the Fallen, we were, uh, we were thinking, all right, hey, could we spin Tyrese off and make him Roadblock from G.I. Joe? And that was our intention. We wanted to make him Roadblock and have like a throwaway line. Hey, were you involved in that crazy robot war? Like, no, 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 you know, maybe. <laughs> but then The Rock got involved and it kind of changed everything. So at that point, Flint was like the head of the G.I. Joe 2 movie. And uh, so, the Lords of Deception were out there in the desert. Optimus comes knocking, like wondering where's Ratchet. He gets into a battle with Lockdown, he falls into a cave, and he finds the Guardians of the Allspark. And it turns out that Dinobots came here to protect the Allspark cube. And somehow they just got trapped underground, and that's why they, they look like dinosaurs. That was our explanation. They, they scanned bones and became dinosaurs. And so they weren't really Autobots. So we created this really amazing panel. I think it was Ken Christensen who did it. 
of Optimus touching the matrix in his chest and then shooting Energon into the fossilized remains of Grimlock, creating an Autobot symbol in his chest and Optimus busting out of the ground riding on top of Grimlock. And that's what we pitched to Michael Bay and it was that key frame that got him on board to direct the fourth movie. The Dinobots came in about halfway through the movie, not, not the end. I remember I was sitting in the theater and the Autobots were about to go on lockdown ship, and I'm like, wow, that's, that was a good movie. And then I realized, the Dinobots haven't shown up yet. Oh man, I have an hour of this. <laughs> <laughs> so the Dinobots showed up about in our draft, about halfway through the film, and Grimlock had a few lines, he talked a little bit. There was also a motorcycle, and this motorcycle was built by a human, at the time we were calling him Spike. And he had built, his dad worked at the military base and he salvaged parts from the base and he built this transforming motorcycle. And at the end of the movie, Optimus christens that motorcycle as a true Autobot and he gives him a spark. And that, I think, is kind of what Squeaks became in the fifth film. Uh, I didn't have much involvement in the fifth film and I, I kind of think that's where Squeaks might have come from. So uh, we pitched the Dinobots and we even pitched the Dinobots combining. And I think the name that we pitched was Dynamite as the combiner. <laughs> and we had some crazy art of like this brass knuckle combiner like punching out. What at the time the studio had informed us we should call Galvatron. And the idea of Galvatron was it was the actual base that the humans were at. The humans had employed the Lords of Deception to keep the Autobots busy so that the humans can build a base that transforms into a giant robot that can kill all the Transformers. And that base, that concept was called Galvatron. Obviously things changed, that didn't quite happen. Uh, but the idea of what KSI was, uh, was there. And uh, we, had, we had this amazing piece it was Optimus holding up his sword. He looked more like a samurai in our concept art. And he was holding up the sword and was struck by lightning and the lightning was shooting out like Thor's hammer in Infinity War, killing all the Decepticon robots. So that was Transformers 4. That was the first instances of, the, of what became the story for Transformers 4. Uh, we had always told the studio, Lance Henriksen, Lance Henriksen, we really want Lance Henriksen. I even spoke to Lance, I told him, we're, we're pushing for you, we really want you involved, and he said, yeah, I'd, uh, I'd absolutely love to be involved in that film. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Hasbro wasn't in charge of cast or final decisions on the script. So, uh, any questions about Transformers 4, or should we dive into anything? I got a big one. Uh -oh. I was at TFCon, what was that, the year Dan Murphy was there? And he said, prominently, because so many people asked about Dinobots, he said, there will never be Dinobots in a Transformers movie. How did you convince Michael Bay about this? Was it the Grimlock Prime being ridden by Optimus Prime? Yeah, it was that, it was that one key frame. Uh, Aaron Archer and um, Brian Goldner flew down to Michael Bay's house in Miami, and sitting on his back porch, they showed him that one, I think they brought four pieces of art and they showed him that piece of art last and he said, I need to direct this. <laughs> that, that, that was the mo moment uh, that would be happening. Everybody else, you want to come up and test something? I'll come to you if you want. Yeah, he can come to you. I don't... Hi. Hello, that was the most <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Little bit of no Jersey, I don't, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> There's, um, over in England, we just don't get much of this cool stuff. But one thing that really struck me, the first three movies, there were lots of add-ons, like children's comics, there were prequel comics, sequel comics, there was an expanded universe. But movie four and movie five didn't get that. Any particular reason why? <laughs> Punch me if you like. So, in the world of comics, if you do a movie adaptation, it typically comes out before the film. 
And because there was so much secrecy about the ending of the film, yeah, I remember Dog of the Moon. The script that was given to IDW to review and base their comic off wasn't a previous track, different ending. And I guess there was some misunderstanding as to when the comic would be released. And the comic came out, I think, maybe a month or two weeks before the film, and it really upset a lot of people on the production side. And from that moment on, all movie tie-in books were put on hold, unfortunately. It's as to not spoil the Yeah, I remember what happened with the Dark of the Moon super yeah. spoiler books. Yeah, it was, you know, it was one of those days where we all got yelled at. <laughs> but, you know, that's typically how the comic industry worked. Comics come out a little early. Yeah, so sometimes like there's a little differences because they're they're done so far out in advance. I remember the first two movies you could see when they were actually using the leader toys to draw the robots. They made it very accurate, but then you'd see it on the screen. I think yeah, it looks different, but it, it looked cool. That reasoning is also the the reason why certain characters don't come out in the first wave, or the second wave, or the third wave, oh. because they want to save certain characters for later. Hey, what's your name? Are you from New Jersey? No. I'm Katie. How did you think about the KSI bots? I thought it was interesting. I thought it was uh, a little... I would have preferred if they had transformed instead of kind of breaking up into glass and then reassembling. I thought that was a cool visual, but I thought that was more appropriate for a character called Makeshift who we always kept in the back of our heads. He was a character from Transformers Prime that could shapeshift. And we always wanted to keep him in the back of our head and say, if he ever makes it into a movie, maybe, maybe that's how he transforms. He breaks up and reassembles himself as a different dude. And we always thought that you know, he would be like our nemesis prime type of character. Like he'd, he'd go undercover. Hey, okay. are, are you from Jersey? We can do this over no, time. Let's start, let's start, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm yeah, you, don't, you don't have to stand there. I want to. Should I sit there? <laughs> if you want to. No, that's all right. <laughs> um, I was just wondering why, I guess, why have Optimus in the, you said your concept for Optimus in the fourth movie was more of a samurai um, design. Why have him in more of a samurai design? That was, look cool? that was just our artistic choice. That, that was, Aaron was the uh, vice president of charge of Transformers, and his design theory states the following. A true designer has a samurai sword on their desk. And so there were certain guys that had swords on their desk, and he gave me a nice, uh, he gave me the Storm Shadow sword from the film for me to have on, on my desk. And uh, that, was just, that was just what he was feeling. It's not nothing that you know. Was, we weren't necessarily trying to push that on the studio. It was just, it was just the, the feel at the time. We were very much the samurais at that point. You, you're gonna have to come way up here, dude. No, I'll come to you. I'll come to you. What? I can do this. Hi. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the production design on the Hasbro side of like the Transformers Prime toys, the communication with the studio, if there was any back and forth or notes given, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, you know, one thing that really sticks out in my head is uh, Beast Hunters kind of came out of nowhere. We had an idea for, we had a, a direction for season three. We knew where we were gonna go, we knew where we wanted it to end, and we, we had the concept for what the follow-up show would be, and, and if you ever heard of a character called Thundertron, we were yeah. thinking pirates. Yeah. They go back to Cybertron, and they're invaded by the pirates. And each of the pirates, there were 13 pirates, and there were 13 colonies. And each Transformer was from a colony. And Cosmos, he was like the silver surfer of Thundertron and the pirates, and he was from Gobatron. And we created this one scene where you see the reflection, like he's talking about Thundertron invading, and you see the reflection of a planet in a cosmos eyes, and then there's an explosion, and it leaves the apple core. But about the toys. So about the toys. Um, 
at that time, there, there seemed to be a lot of animosity between the design team and the production team because the studio team wanted more freedom. And the design teams had certain restrictions that, hey, listen, we, we can't do this in a toy form or it would be difficult for us to do this. Can you put in more characters? And the studio was like, well, that, that's, we're already over budget. We can't, we can't put any more characters in. And it came to a head at season three where there was some staff changing and a new design director was put in place on the toy side. And he said, we need animals. We need animals and we like imagine dragons and we need dragons. <laughs> we need to fight dragons. And so Beast Hunters was just kind of thrust in there in season three and the next show just kind of went away all of a sudden. And because of the very short design period, the studio said, well, we're gonna design Optimus the way we're gonna make them, based off a certain silhouette. And the toy team said, we're gonna make them how we boy as opposed to the show. It was also somehow, and the design team said, that the other characters would get upgrades as well. And so that's how those other toys became Beast Hunter toys. Unfortunately, there was not a budget for that on the show side. Uh, it's another reason why Credit King looks so drastically different in the toy as opposed to the show. Short time to develop and um, basically saying, all right, here's the silhouette. We're each gonna design our own Credit King based off this one silhouette that we both agree on. Come on up. Okay. Okay. I, I feel a little underdressed. I have somebody over here one second. Oh, okay, go, go away. <laughs> so you worked on the character design and visual design or story design? Uh, I started off uh, brought in as a toy design. Okay. And then I was moved over to the entertainment side. So anything with like video games, IW, uh, licensed uh, stuff, apps, movies, TV show, uh, came through me. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. I, I gotta go to this and then we can, we can chat. <laughs> Everyone's coming at me with microphones. Okay. So bouncing off of that previous question with uh, Thundertron and such, when when it was when the message came to you, let's get animals, let's get dragons. Was there ever any thought into well, let's just make all of the pirates animals and dragons and if. So, what, what led you away from that? Good question. First of all, this gentleman right here looks like Simon Furman, and it's freaking me out. <laughs> oh my gosh. Take off your mask. <laughs> okay. So what, what, was, what was... Oh yeah, so no. Uh, the Pirates basically just... It kind of ended, because we really were set on Thundertron being Thundertron, because it was kind of our F you to Thundercats and Voltron. <laughs> so Thundertron. And uh, that's one of my favorite toys because he has a peg leg. So he's a real pirate because he has a peg leg. Uh, no, um, we, we knew that there were some toys in the back burner that we wanted to bring. Uh, and we, we looked at um, the Galvatron from Beast Wars 2. Unfortunately, that mold no longer exists. We looked at some of the Beast Wars toys to reuse as Amazon exclusives. Uh, we looked at Predaking with the G1 Predaking, doing some funky colors and bring it back as an exclusive. But fortunately, that that stuff, the market started shrinking, and there were less and less exclusives at the time. Which is why the um, what is it, the Dark Energon guys ended up at Big Bad Toy Store. I think those were maybe Walmart or Amazon, and they just kind of got dropped, and Big Bad picked them up. Uh, was it true that? Season, you were gonna make it with Galvatron? Uh, nope. <laughs> uh, no, uh, for Transformers Prime, no. Our idea was to kill off Megatron and be done with him. It was, we were gonna, we were gonna move on. Uh, one, our direction was, we don't care which Autobots live, or, which Decepticons live or die, as long as Knockout stays alive. <laughs> We saw Knockout as the breakout Decepticon, yeah. and we wanted to make sure there was a strongly worded email 
that said, you will not kill this character off. Um, so I feel as if in, um, in both Age of Extinction and in Transformers Prime, um, there was some influence from other Transformers lore, like Transformers Animated, especially with character choices and having a strong central cast of Autobots that we could focus on characters. Um, were there, what, whether it was animated or not, were there you know, parts of Transformers lore and storytelling that you thought were especially strong points that you wanted to bring into your creative control? We knew we wanted to change the cast up. Uh, originally, uh, Drift was always in there. He was always going to be there, but he was IDW Drift. He was the white car. We basically took IDW artwork and we reworked it to make it look like a real life car. We wanted Drift to be the ninja and Takara came to us and said, we are a bit concerned that he may speak in a negative stereotype. And I was the one who was directed to tell them, we are sorry, but we don't control that, unfortunately. Um, Smokescreen, Crosshairs, was that his name? Yeah. Crosshairs was originally Smokescreen. Because Smokescreen was in Transformers Prime and we visualized him as a boxer. And we sent in the work, the artwork with the 38s on the side in the smoke screen card. And he had these big, giant boxing gloves on him because we always thought of him as the hand to hand fighter. And then Hound, we took a G.I. Joe fan, added a few details to it, and that's what we pitched as Hound. And we pitched him very much as IDW's cup with the sidecar and everything. That's how we pitched him. And the vehicle choice was great, but to me that vehicle choice was more indicative of Bulkhead. I wish they kind of made a, maybe changed the character a little bit and made him Bulkhead. Um, I was just wondering, this has been a question burning in my mind for years. So in the original series, we see how the Insecticons came to be. I was wondering if you were ever going to explain how insect life Decepticons came into the Transformers Prime world, because it's never explained. They just are. <laughs> they, ju they just are. Oh, but you know, you had a second part to your question about lore and stuff. We, we had the big binder of Revelation, and we would always look to that, to like, oh, all right, is it time for Cosmic Ross? Is it time for the last Autobot? Uh, so we would always look to see what what things from the lore we could tell, but that was almost a, an afterthought after we got a draft back from the studios as to what else we could inject and whether they'd be okay with that. Ye yell it out. Um, no! <laughs> we usually record this for a DVD. I, I believe it's pronounced Divid. Oh, I'm sorry. Divid. Or Divid. Or Ravage. So you were saying how you came to the entertainment side after a while, and you worked on the video games, and I was wondering, um, the Activision games, the, the War for Cybertron, Ball of Cybertron, and then Rise of the Dark Spark came, and it was, eh. I was wondering if there I was- I didn't work on that game. You didn't? No, but I understand why it exists. I, I was more wondering, was there a more proper sequel to Fall of Cybertron that was originally intended, instead of the half movie cross? No, no, not necessarily. No, we, we kind of had it where they left Cybertron okay. after that. Um, but I understand why the Dark Spark existed. You're using your assets that you already have, yeah. so you're saving a ton of money. I don't believe uh, Fall of Cybertron performed as well as War for Cybertron. So that, that made it have uh, an impact on, on that I scene. personally liked it more. One, two. Two, three. Somebody tackle her and just <laughs> and take and take the lighter home. I know Capoeira. <laughs> Back to Transformers Prime Megatron. What happened to him after his exile? Do you know? Did you have any ideas for that? <laughs> so something I haven't really talked about is our concept of the last Transformers. So this was something that, this was just an internal document that I had put together with John Bresman and uh, Andy Schmidt and uh, Aaron kind of looked at it and we're not gonna call, we're not gonna call it Toyland The Last Transformers. 
So the idea was like a thousand years in the future. And it was inspired by an issue of IDW comics where you see Ironhide in the future and he's all old and beat up and he's got the G2 symbol on there. And we always thought, well, if we ever make a game out of this, it's going to start off with a with like a voiceover of Ironhide. I've, I've seen the rise of Megatron. I've, I've held the Matrix. We fought Unicron. And then that Cybertron turned around, you'd see that half the Cybertron was missing. It was all blown off. And we had all new characters. Ironhide was the only character that we wanted to keep. And he was actually Iron Magnus. And he walked around with the hammer as the king. And uh, there was a... Uh, and I'm trying to think, like, it's so long ago that we made this. There was, like, I think Skip Track or... Yeah, Skip Track was one of the Autobots. It was, like, a racer. There was, uh... What was his name? Something Magnet. Something Magnet was, like, the leader. And then it became Magnet Prime. And the idea of the Magnet was that, you know, the toy would be able to hold the Magnet. The Prime, the Matrix, in its hands, like a Magnet. And then uh, I had always wanted to make the leader of the Decepticons um, a female. And we didn't quite have a name for her, or a design for her, or anything. Um, but I would always thought that one of the, uh, one of the Decepticons that she'd have in her crew, they'd have an arm, a red arm and a blue arm, and they turned into the pile drivers. <laughs> And then maybe in the toy we would do R and F, and then F and R, and, and make you guys fight it out. <laughs> All right. This guy pimping the gold chain. So with developing Prime You're and from New Jersey with that chain. <laughs> so with developing Prime and the movie verse, both of them used Unicron as Earth. Which set of fiction came up with the idea first? Oh, it was the studio who pitched to us for Transformers Prime. They came to us and said, we want to make Unicron the Earth. And I said, can we blow the Earth up? And that's when Aaron said, no, because my daughter lives here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, fine, I've got a kid on the way, and fine. So it was, it was the, the guys behind the studio for Transformers Prime who came up with that idea. And it was interesting to see that it got incorporated into the fifth film. But at the same time, it's kind of like a gut punch, knowing that we're not going to quite see what comes next. Hey, I choose you. So besides Arachnid, were there any other Beast Wars inspired characters that would play up the hat? So I think it, one time at BotCon, I said, the following is true. One of the following statements is true. Arachnid is either Black Arachnid, will either become Black Arachnia, was Black Arachnia, or is the daughter of Black Arachnia? One of those statements was true. Oh. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you which one. Um, but no, there was, there was no other Beast Wars characters that we wanted. We had our wish list for season two and three of characters we wanted to bring in. Blaster was on the list, Smokescreen was on the list. Uh, oh my God, some, I think Ravage was on the list. I think Cosmos was on the list, and we wanted to use the Derek Wyatt concept of Cosmos from anime, where he was a cool-looking spaceship, and he crash lands on a B-movie set, and he scans the movie prop to become the circular <laughs> flying saucer <laughs> UFO. That was Derek Wyatt's idea. We, de we definitely wanted to use that, and the studio was like, no, we're not doing that. But Tim, page 19, you have endings for everyone else, but what happened to him? Didn't, did he get caught in the negative universe or something? No, the that Phantom Zone? That is an excellent <laughs> question. <laughs> so, Soundwave, I, I, the answer is I don't know. I don't know what happened to him, unfortunately. It just, it's left ambiguous. Maybe he could come back, maybe he couldn't. I, I don't know. But I, I can talk to you about Soundwave real quick. One of, one of my favorite Soundwave stories was uh, the episode where Black, or Arachnia and Soundwave face off, and right as she lunges at him, he opens the space bridge and she flies through. The original scene was, that is when Soundwave says, Soundwave superior, Arachnid inferior. And that was the revelation that he could talk, 
but he did it while there was no one around to hear him talk. And that was what, that's what made it for us, that he said it while there was no one there, and he just kept walking. And no one, no one on the show knew that he could talk. But it was changed. It was changed without our knowledge. Unfortunately. They felt it was more dramatic to have him say it when he was captured by the Autobots. Okay, unless we're to this guy. No, no, no. What's, what's your question? Um, hi. So, hi. Hi. <laughs> so, in the, hi. Um, in the show, um, there's a lot of Autobots. Yeah. Um, so, what are No, no, they were, there was no other plans. I think there was one Vietcom called Steve, if I, if I recall. <laughs> and that would be like, you know the guy in Deadpool, the, the Hydra agent, I think his name's Bob? Yeah. That, we were gonna go to Steve. Oh, it's Steve, and it's named after Steve Bono, who was a Hasbro designer at the time. He didn't work on, he was, he was like the baby guy, but yeah, it was Steve. I want to come to you. How are you doing? I got a question about the. Uh, okay, we got the Bumblebee movie coming out in December. Yes. And then, like, Transformers 7, I guess you could say, is looking to be here nor there or whatever. Are we going to see actually the, the Quintessa, Unicron? Do you think, in your opinion, do you think that's going to happen or is that just Bumblebee's, that's it? I mean, there seems to be a lot of that up in the air right now. All right, thank you for the question. I like to tell people, uh, the only good movie is the first movie, because I didn't work on that one. <laughs> so that's why the first movie is so good. It has that moment of discovery in that, in that back alley where, where Sam meets the Autobots. It has that perfect moment of discovery. I think Bumblebee started off as a prequel, but it's actually going to be a reboot. I think it's going to be successful, and I think we're going to be able to continue with movies in that timeline okay. and kind of ignore some of the World War II stuff that might be in that film. Okay. <laughs> that's my hope. Okay. That, that's my hope, anyway. No, oh, you don't have a question. Um, question. So you said that you had wanted Knockout in, like, as like a Decepticon in Transformers Prime to be the one that survives. Um, would you have had any like plans for him then? If, 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 if. Conjects and Dura? I don't. I don't know. No, I don't think that. I don't think that existed at the time. Uh, but uh, no, we just thought the, the voice acting was great. The, the concept of the character was so great. We wanted to keep him, and the idea was like, all right, just have him join the Autobots, for, and then he'll go back to being Decepticon. He'll go. He'll be like the guy. Like when Thundertron arrives, he'd be the guy. Like, you're gonna need a guy to show you around Cybertron. I'm gonna be that dude. Right, right behind you. So this is a pretty like broad question, so if the answer is, I don't know, that's fine, but like, do you have any like interesting or fun stories with TFP Ratchet? Different coons! <laughs> All right, I really like, that's my favorite version of Ratchet. So when I read the comments, it's the Idwa, a lot of people say IDW, it's actually pronounced Idwa. <laughs> when, by the way, has anyone called James Roberts James Robert? Because I've been telling people that's how you pronounce his name and that's how you should say it. So, uh, so Ratchet, that voice just sticks in my head. So whenever I read a comic, that's the voice I hear in my head. Um, the idea for Ratchet, yes, we had definite plans, 100% plans for Ratchet. He was going to stay behind, and we were going to spin him off in a new show called Unit. It was Unit Eve. It was just a placeholder name. It was Unit Eve. And what Unit E was, it was the Avengers. <laughs> and we did one comic book at New York Comic Con, and that was it. And uh, the comic book had nothing to do with the other story that we were gonna build. It was Stretch Armstrong, and in our version, it was Hulk Hogan at Stretch Armstrong. <laughs> and he had a gold belt, he had a, he had a silver belt called the Silver Hawk. <laughs> there was Ratchet. There was a Croyer. A Croyer was like our snake eyes. He couldn't talk. And he was full size. Uh, there was Duke, who at times we thought, or maybe we switched her out with Scarlet. There was Leoric. 
there was Rom, and there was Matt Trapper. And there was another character at the, let's just call him Bum. But it, there was another character. And there was Tunrar. And Tunrar was the ancient mystic who fought the, inhuman, the Inhumanoids a long time ago. He, and there was uh, Princess Lolly. She was a badass. <laughs> she was tiny. She was like a fucking fairy from Candyland. You did not want to mess with her. And the idea was that a long time ago, Candyland was where all the humanoid monsters lived, and they vanished, them, they vanished from the earth. And then it became Candyland, because everything was so peaceful. But you did not want to mess with her. And we were toying around with another character called Doughboy. So we can never come up with a name for that guy, for the Play-Doh guy. And Unit E came from, at the time, we were working on ROM. And we were thinking, all right, we got the rights back. What are we going to do with ROM? We got to give them Space Knights. And I said, why don't we give them guys that are all like from other brands that we're trying to launch? So Unit E was inspired by ROM and the Space Knights. So it was ROM, Matt Tracker, Leoric, and a dune buggy transformer called Chopper Face. <laughs> And his name was Chopperface because we couldn't call him Dinobot because he wasn't the dinosaur. But the head was Dinobot. And he was the vamp from G.I. Joe with the stripes of Dinobot. And that artwork was amazing. <laughs> and then that, Aaron took that and flipped it on the side and made a unity. So, the, so at one point in Transformers Prime, there was, a, there was a reference to Mask. And what we had originally wanted to be the ending was you see a door open, and a human walks through the door, and Optimus hands him a transformation card, and he says, are you Matthew Tracker of the mechanically advanced secret knights? <laughs> and he's like, Mask, you just call us Mask. Here's a tea card. here's Ratchet. And that was gonna be how Mask spun off from that. Thank you. So, so yeah, we, we like Ratchet. <laughs> you can come sit next to me and ask me your question next. It's not weird. <laughs> All right, what's up? What are some big lessons that can be taken from Hasbro's attempts to build shared universe out of their properties? <laughs> <laughs> so you had a question? <laughs> <laughs> I think you need the right person with the right amount of authority to build any extended universe, whether you're at DC, or at Marvel, Hasbro, wherever you are, Mattel, you need the right person with the right level of authority to be able to veto others in order to create a distinct vision and create a roadmap to that. So I, I have not seen the roadmap, I have not seen where they want to go, and I, I hope it works out because I'm a fan. I love G.I. Joe, I love Transformers, and He-Man, and Power Rangers, and I think it's awesome that Power Rangers can now cross over with Transformers. I think it'd be great if the, like, the Rangers are looking for their Zords, and they come across the Dinobots, and they're like, we found our Zords, but they're not quite what we thought they would be. <laughs> What's up? My question was, were, you, were the movie studios plan on making any other generations? Like, So, before Age of Extinction, we had done some conceptual designs for, uh, there was, the Autobots took Lennox and uh, Tyrese, and they traveled back in time. They traveled back in time, and you see the Allspark in all its glory. And that's where the Dinobots were, because they were defenders of the Allspark, and Optimus had to reformat, and he reformats into a gorilla. And Megatron follows them back in time, and he reformats into a T-Rex. So that was the original, original concept. So I think some of that carried over into the, the last night, because there was some artwork that got released of Chior and, and Optimus Primal. Anything else? Okay, we have, okay, we have one over here and one over here. Find it out. Uh, <laughs> Russell. He's not asking me yet, so I'll go over here first. Go first. You. <laughs> I have the mic. I'm the <laughs> You know, um, 
I have a big problem with all these crossing the brands. Why? <laughs> so I, I, I don't like it. I'll be honest with you. I, I don't like it at all. I mean, I, I get it what they did, what Marvel did back in the 80s with G.I. Joe and Transformers, but trying to, I know that they're, it's their brand, but trying to create a universe and then from there spin it off, why, dude? So it's a great way to launch something by taking a popular brand, putting in a little nugget of something else, and then seeing how well people react to that. It's a great launching pad. It's, it's a very affordable launching pad. Change the True, but um, you know, as a kid, you know what? I'm gonna back up. So, Joaquin, anybody watch Voltron on Netflix? Yes. Joaquin directed G.I. Joe Resolute, and I pitched him a story, and we did some test animation for this. I kid you not, we did some in house test animation for this. I pitched him a story of G.I. Joe versus Transformers. And the way it opens up is, you're on a plane, red light goes off, you, Wild Bill's at the helm, you've got Duke and Snake Eyes and Stalker and Scarlet. And uh, this was John Bresman, Andy Schmidt, and myself put this together. And Tyler Scarlet, who's now at Lucasfilm, did the animation. And the red light goes off and they all jump. There's Stuff blowing up around them, clouds whisking through them, and as the clouds part, then you see Cybertron. It was them invading Cybertron. Because Optimus had called them there. His Cobra Commander had built his Terradrome around Shockwave's base, and, and then the Dreadnoughts were like cyborgs. And G.I. Joe is a complicated issue, because G.I. Joe is a baby war brand. It cannot compete with Halo. It cannot compete with Call of Duty. Those are very violent and aggressive brands. That is not what Hasbro is. So there are restrictions on G.I. Joe, which is why I think it's good that they're going with the Snake Eye story angle for future film development. The G.I. Joe team wanted the crossover. We wanted to do toys, transforming toys, where G.I. Joe figures could fit in them. The Transformers team didn't need it. Transformers, the worst selling Transformers sold 10 times better than the best selling G.I. Joe. They didn't need it. And I, the only thing that ever came out of it were their San Diego Comic-Con exclusives. All right, we are at the nine minute arc. So if you've been debating whether or not you wanted to ask a question, I'd suggest you make up your mind now. Um, here we go. Okay, this was actually asked by one of my friends. But was there ever ideas for Rumble and Frenzy? or Frenzy Rumble in the Bayverse or Primeverse, was that ever brought up? No, no, there was, no, <laughs> hard no, hard no. Yeah, or toys, but those toys for Rumble and Frenzy were based off an MMOG from China, I believe NetDragon, which never came out. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go to China for, for two weeks, work on the game, and then it never came out. So, uh, Thundertron was in that game, um, Rumble Frenzy were in the game, Ironhide was in the game. That's where that Ironhide came from, that I think it was Sergeant Cup in the US. So. All right, arms up. So I've got this, one, two, three. This man right here. We'll start with I've two. chosen him. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm officially saying I saw three hands. Am I missing anybody? Okay. All right, this is a hypothetical uh, since you were involved with a lot of the media. If you were gonna do a Transformers 7 movie, if you were involved in it, and you already had that Easter egg of Unicron being planet Earth, how would you attack that story because you can't blow up the Earth? <laughs> I would get the crew from the last stand of the Wreckers to go in and kill the spark of Unicron. And in doing so, the H die. And I would get Nick Roach and James Robert involved. <laughs> okay, who's up? Who else was there? Okay, there's Mike in the back and Josh over here. Okay. I think they're actually asking for high fives. I don't think they have questions. 
Uh, so earlier you mentioned how uh, a lot of the other uh, characters in Transformers Prime got upgrades in Beast Hunters. And we saw that in the toys. And the toys seem to have some influence of uh, Beast Wars characters. Was there any plans to actually do repaints as those Beast Wars characters? No, but now that you say it, it would have made a cool Bakon set. <laughs> yeah, I did hear that they had plans, but... Yeah, no, no, no. That's a good idea. So we ended up in Transformers Prime with Arachnid having this weird hypnotic control over all our Insecticons, and then getting the zombie vampire virus thing, and then all of them getting stranded on the moon. What was the plan going forward with that idea? So there was a definite plan. So before the final episodes got drastically reworked, the idea was that Megatron was gonna find her on the moon, and he was gonna take her as his queen. And together, they would lead an army of zombified Insecticons to Cybertron to invade and wipe out everyone except Knockout. <laughs> Can you define Tate as queen? <laughs> make his bride, make her his bride. Would she have survived? Uh, would he have survived? <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever been married? I have. <laughs> I'm still on my first one, but jeez. Okay, we have five minutes. So anybody who didn't make up their mind? Okay, I see you in the back. Of course it's all the way in the back. Okay, so I see Mike in the back. Do I see anybody else? Is that Petronium? Okay. Not mine. I've always wanted to know if uh, at the end of Revenge of the Fallen, when uh, Optimus combines with Jetfire and Jolt does the job, was that a nod to Armada? No, that was, hey, there's a really cool car called Volt coming out. Let's give this guy something to do in the two scenes that he's in. <laughs> and that's where that came from. Fair enough. Uh, and the, the first time I saw the artwork for Optimus and Jetfire, it was the final artwork for Optimus and Jetfire combined like flying over the pyramids. I think it was the week before the first movie came out. That's how far in advance they were working on it. Thank you. All right. Hey, Thank you so much. What, we got one last question. Oh, one last question? So with the Prime toys, when they first came out, you had these like first edition versions, and then you had the regular, like you always remade another RC, another regular Bumblebee, stuff like that. So is that like because we're in half of the first ones, we made second ones, or just, Russian production? No, we were super excited about the first ones. But at that point, uh, the contract between Hasbro and Takara had been renegotiated. And there was still fallout from the Revenge of the Fallen Optimus Prime. Being it, have you ever tried to transform that thing? Yeah. You know how many letters we got from parents? <laughs> <laughs> that toy, in conjunction with rising costs, oil, plastics, manufacturing, labor issues, and at the time, the contract with Takara and Hasbro had to be renegotiated. It was renegotiated for less parts in the toys, which led to more uh, intuitive transformation. Hey guys, thank you so much. I, uh, I want to leave you with a few words. Look, we're, we're all different. We all come from different places. Let's, we all have our own ideas. Let's try and find the, the area in the middle where we can all agree and be kind to each other. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Woo!